Hi there, and welcome once again to Unstoppable Mindset. Yep, unstoppable. That's what we are. It's uh, we're actually early in the morning for me out here in California where we're recording this particular episode. Our guest is Rob Wentz. I was interviewed on Rob's podcast, and he can tell us more about that. But of course, I told him the cost for being interviewed was that he had to come on Unstoppable Mindset and let me chat with him a little bit. And he so graciously did it. So here we are talking all the way from California to Pennsylvania and back again. Rob, thanks very much for being on Unstoppable Mindset and welcome. Of course, Michael. It's an honor to be here. I love it. I love the idea of the platform and I love the fact that you got up super early to do this with me. So thank you. Well, fortunately for me, I guess I'm usually up about 530 in the morning. So it worked out okay. And um, for those listening, Rob and I share a love and interest of radio. I did radio in college and not too much after that. But after September 11th, I was interviewed a lot. So I've been associating with the media for quite a long time. Rob has been in radio for more than 20 years. He has his own podcast and and uh, has has been very successful at it and continues to grow. He's a successful executive leadership coach, among other things, and I think uh, has a lot to to talk about. So let's do that. Why don't we start? Why don't you tell me a little about the earlier Rob, you know, growing up and all that sort of stuff? Sure. Earlier me, you know, the my, earlier you, my uh, parents got divorced when I was real young, probably like one year old, I was maybe maybe it was one. Uh, so I have two families, uh, two siblings on each side, grew up mostly with my mom, with my dad, uh, like every other weekend growing up. Uh, man, growing up, I was kind of a I was a weird kid, <laughs> you know, I, I think that I, I just wrote a chapter in this book uh, called The Spiritual Fitness Survivor. And the chapter, I'm just going to get it out here real quick and give myself a, a, a cheap plug there. Uh, fourth edition Spiritual Fitness Survivor by Emilio Ramon. He, he puts together these um, anthology books. And my chapter is a lot about what my early life was like, because the title of the chapter is the bold art of being yourself, the six essential rules for unleashing the real you. And I felt growing up like I never was able to like get who I actually was on the inside out. So I always felt like I didn't know who I was. And there was a version of me that was kind of like stuck on the inside. Um, I didn't know how to express myself or how to communicate well. So I think on the outside, people probably wouldn't have noticed because I've heard this from people. They say, I never noticed that you felt that way or I never thought you felt these ways, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, but inside was like, I didn't know how to be myself. Like I, I was, it was a disconnect, right? And I think a lot of people can resonate with that. There was this disconnect that happened inside of me um, through, uh, you know, having divorced parents and not having uh, an outlet, good communication skills, uh, not having uh, room to be, uh, emotionally stable, um, like maybe low emotional intelligence is the right word there. And it led to this, this journey for me of figuring out how to be myself. And what does that look like for me to be myself and be confident to so build my confidence, build my self esteem. So I'd say my young uh, life was, I, I just felt out of place. And I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere, I, I guess is a good way to explain it. Like I never felt like I really fit in. And for some reason, I gravitated towards radio. Looking back on it now, it was, I think God got, guides us in directions, whether we knowingly know why we're heading there or not, right? And I think for me, radio was this outlet because this was before the internet. <laughs> That's how long <laughs> ago it was, right? Maybe maybe the early days of the internet, this, this would have been like maybe 1999 is when I started in radio. So the internet existed, but not in the form it does today, right? And um, I really believe I, I went into radio to find my voice because what radio does is like you get to... You can either fake it and be a fake version of yourself, right? That you're you're putting on this character. But as the years go on in radio, it turned out I went from like this uh, this character I created on the air to like being more of me. And the more of me I became on the air, the better I got as a person. The more of me actually came out in real life. And those those two things like worked together in tandem to help me kind of come out of my shell, I guess you could say. Uh, so my early life, that's. That was a, you know, I, that was a big part of my life. 10 years old, I started really loving radio and doing pretend radio shows in my bedroom. And 
Um, I loved professional wrestling when I was a kid. That was another kind of like fantasy outlet, I guess, to like put on like a character. Uh, and then I was, I was 15 years old. I got a job in radio and my career kind of started from there. Do you think that most kids go through this kind of stage of really not knowing themselves? Um, and is it, or is it the more the exception than the rule? I think for sure. Right. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of kids, especially in your teenage years, you, you're struggling with your identity. And, and that's that's why I think that the whole uh, issue right now with teenagers and why the, the trans movement and and seems to be hitting so hard with that age range is because you are in like a transition of figuring out who you are. Right. But I, I think before the age of maybe 12 or 13, you have a better sense of who you are instinctively. I love to ask people the question, what did you want to be when you were 10 years old? Because I think it's a great place. Like you're old enough at 10 to know what you love just, just because you love it. You don't need a reason to love it. It's nobody told you to like it. You just, you just like it. Right. But then also at 10, you're not quite influenced by the outside world yet, where you still mm -hmm. have your own internal desire uh, for what you naturally uh, gravitate towards. But I feel like I had more of that than most kids. I feel like I had more of an unsureness of who I was than most kids. And it was more of like a lack of confidence in like how I felt on the inside. I didn't feel like was accepted on the outside. Hmm. Um, and that could have been, I don't have many memories of growing up. Right. So that could have been me thinking that, or it could have been influenced by uh, people in my life. I'm not totally sure, but that's just how I felt. Uh, but yeah, I, to answer your question, I think most kids do feel that yeah. way to a certain extent, but I think I felt it more than most. I think for me, um, growing up, I always wanted to be a teacher. I don't know why, but I always wanted to be a teacher. I liked teachers. I liked school. But I also, and I don't know why I thought this, I also thought, you know, um, who knows how life will really make me go. Mm -hmm. And what I've realized through the years, having spent most of my life in professional sales, and then after September 11th, being a public speaker is, in reality, I still got to be a teacher. It's just that I didn't become a teacher in the same way that teachers do in school, that is, with a professional job, just going to a classroom every day. But I did get a secondary teaching credential, so I understand teaching professionally. And I think um, I still ended up being a professional teacher. Now I get to teach and, as I tell people, sell life and philosophy rather than selling computer hardware. I but, love that because, boy, there's so many teachers out there that are actually teachers, right, that work for schools that have not tapped into their full potential. But I mean, those teachers also are helping to shape the youth of America. So my hat's off to them because that's a hard job to do. An important job and a underappreciated job. But Absolutely. I think we all should strive to be teachers, right? Teaching ourselves and then teaching others. I feel like that's a that's a role we all should have as, as you learn and grow through life and you uh, make your mess your message, then you should be out there teaching people, helping them. Uh, yeah. Learn the things that you've already learned. Yeah, in one way or another. And it and it may yeah. not be in the way that you think. I never thought that I would end up being a public speaker and traveling the world and speaking and also even doing a podcast. Um, I had originally thought I wanted to be a teacher in a classroom. Well, that was what I grew up with from a standpoint of the outside world was saying, this is what a teacher is. Mm. But I've grown to realize that it's so much more. And teachers, professionals are so underappreciated and so undervalued. Uh, and they... They do their best. Most of them do. I mean, there are always some that are a problem, but they do their best and are just so underappreciated and so not recognized for all the, the good that they do and the things that they bring into the world. Yeah, I've often thought, you know, when it comes to teachers, my son's in uh, fourth grade right now and he goes to a really good public school. I, I, I'm really happy that uh, Central Pennsylvania, we have some really good public schools here and I think, man, it, to be a teacher in that, what an opportunity, an opportunity to like work in elementary schools and to work with, 
you know, 10 year old kids. I, I, I still feel so much like a kid myself. A lot of the times. Yeah. I the, like, I love being around kids because they're just fun and they love what they love. They love life. They're in a good mood. They, they just light, they light things up. And I feel like oftentimes as parents or as adults, we kind of push the kids to the side, like go do your, that's how I felt growing up kind of, you know, go do your own thing. The adults are hanging out. I love to bring the kids in. I, I want to, I'd rather hang out with the kids at the kids table than sit at the adults table. They're just, they're fun and they, they're excited about life and they're full of energy. Um, so yeah, I, I, my hat's off to, uh, teachers out there who are super passionate about what they do. I love seeing like really passionate male teachers who are intentional because you don't have many male teachers that are very intentional with trying to, you know, help kids grow and not just like learn what they're supposed to learn in school, but also like if you can be a public school teacher and slip in leadership principles and faith principles and things like that under the radar, right? I, I think that's the most amazing thing. And my my son's school actually this year just started a leadership class. They're going to start it in the second marking period. And I was like, how cool is that? They are instituting a leadership class in elementary schools. So that's amazing. And it's too bad that all too often it has to be slipped in under the radar. I mean, we, <laughs> you know, we, it, it isn't dealing with any particular religion or anything. It's basic philosophical concepts. And we really should, do our best to teach kids that the problem is the parents, as you point out, kids are fun loving, they're full of life, they don't have hidden agendas. Mm -hmm. um, that comes so much later on. And then parents or adults are always trying to warp the world to, oh, this is what it really should be based on just their individual beliefs rather than themselves taking the time to learn and study anymore. Yeah. Very true. Or as you would say, they get stuck. Yeah, right. We get stuck in our own nonsense and then uh, we get triggered by anything that challenges us getting unstuck, right? <laughs> it's kind of hilarious yeah, when you think oh, about it. Sad. Oh, I hear you. Why is it that people have so much struggle with change and just really hate it, even though change is always all around us? Well, I, yeah, to talk about the ego, I guess your ego doesn't like change. You're like it just survival. I think I think of it in a survival sense. You know, in order to survive, you'd like things to remain the same because they're natural and they're uh, that. That's the way that you're used to it. The more you're used to things, the more you can predict the future. The more you can predict the future, uh, the more safe you can be and you can protect yourself. Right. So I get like. Uh, avoiding change is like, okay, if I stay the same, at least I'm in, I feel like I have some sense of control of what's happening in my life. So I have a better chance of surviving, which is actually not true. And it's, no. it's, it's counterintuitive to think of it the other way, right? Because the other way of thinking of it is like the unknown is super scary. And if I go out into the unknown, I don't know what's going to happen next. There's a good chance I could die. But it's that's like, uh, like the base level, I think of it. But really, that's the only way you're going to grow. Um, and I think the whole change thing, I mean, I think part of its instinct, like survival instinct, a part of it is, uh, you know, it's just nobody ever teaches us that change is good. Unless you come up in a family where they embrace change, then change is like this foreign, scary concept that, oh my gosh, is like it's terrifying because change means that like, I'm going to have to think differently. I can remember years ago, my ex-wife, uh, she was, she would tell me, you need to change these things about yourself. And I was, she was trying to change me in a good way. I, uh, because I was miserable. I was so miserable with myself and just, uh, well, going back to that chapter in that book, uh, and spiritual fitness survivor, I was not able to be my authentic self. And it was like, it torture. I was, it was like torture for me because I was so stuck in this version of me that I didn't want to be and I didn't know how to get the real version out. Right. So I would tell her, You want me to change? I can't change. This is the way that I think. This is the way that I am. This is how I am. And you're going to have to just deal with me. That's the kind of, that's what I thought. And that's mm. what I said. And I think for a lot of people, that is the truth. Right. Uh, they, and this was, I, I can speak directly to it because this was me. I did not know that I could change. I did not know 
that I could think differently. Uh, and I was probably in my mid twenties. Uh, that's probably around 25 when I was thinking this, right? So I did not know that I could change because I did not ever have anybody in my life who spoke that way about change, who, who, who said, you don't have to think this way. Things aren't black and white. Um, so I think a big part of it is people in change is they've never been around anybody that is constantly embracing change and trying to change because change is really painful, right? So you start, you go to try to change and it's super painful. Um, it's really hard, especially positive change. It's, it seems to be easier to change in a negative way. <laughs> that seems to be an easy one. I don't know why, but like, that's just like gravitating towards all of the vices in your life. You just keep diving into those I mean, you'll change into a horrible person. Uh, but to change positively, it's really fighting against a, uh, a resistance is, is constantly coming against you. And my mentor, uh, his name's Ray Overdorf. Ray's an amazing man. Uh, he's been my mentor for a number of years. He's in his mid 80s. He's been a coach as long as I've been alive. And Ray always said this to me. He's like, you're going to feel this resistance when you're trying to change until a certain breakthrough point and all of that energy that that's resisting you is coming around behind you and then it propels you forward and gives you momentum but you've got to persist in the desire to change until that momentum gets behind you and starts to push you and there's so much truth to that and it can be so hard to see on a daily basis so i think for you know a lot of people it's like i want to change and they really do want to change but it's like the new year's resolution thing, right? They put a month in, they put a yeah. couple months in, they don't see it, they don't feel it. So they just stop. Uh, and then you start again later on and you stop and you start again later on and you stop. And that's, that can be really um, disheartening. And so they yeah. just don't move forward. Well, what happened to you that you finally did change because clearly you have, I don't, I had my son, Max, he's nine. Right. So that was, like the beginning of change for me. So that was like, I knew I couldn't be, I was, I was, I had some addictions. Um, I had negative thinking, um, limiting beliefs. I was just unaware also. And I was not where I wanted to be in life. I was not who I wanted to be, who that version inside of me hadn't come out. Right. So that was the big, a big one. I knew when Max was going to be born, I really started to, to work on changing when I found out my ex-wife was pregnant with him. So it's been close to 10 years. Um, and then over that, it was like, I couldn't turn it off. I think for me, and I don't know how other people feel about this, but it, for me, it's not an option. Like I don't have an option to not continue to grow and change because I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't. It's, it's, it's almost, it's not even something that I think about it's like, no, I have to do this because if I'm not pushing myself to get better and to be a better person, and I'm not talk talking about success and money and stuff. Of course, those are things that uh, are on my goals list of certain uh, levels of, of those things. But more it's about internally, how do I feel about myself? How am I showing up in the world for people around me? How am I being more of service? And being a Christian, it's like, how am I being more like Jesus? How could I be more like Jesus on a daily basis? How could I be more loving to other people in my life? How could I be paying attention to what God's will is for my life? And what, what am I supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to be acting? And um, that's kind of that momentum for us so that it was resistance and it still can be sometimes, but now I feel more momentum of like, it's, for me, it's not even an option. It's like, I, I have to continue to get better because if I didn't, what what else? I, I look at like the purpose of life. What more of a purpose is there to life than to keep breaking through different levels of yourself, right? Finding more of your potential, finding more of who God created you to be. So for me, that's that's my motivation for it. So now, are you married now? I'm engaged. I'm getting married okay. uh, in two months. We'll be... Uh, November 25th of that's right. 2023 where I'm getting remarried. Yeah. So that's right. You said there. earlier, your fiance, your fiance's birthday is the 6th of December. So that's cool. Well, yeah. so what, um, 
if it's not too nosy. So the way you you um, dealt with your ex-wife and that you're the way you are, you don't change. That's changed. Do you have conversations ever with her about that anymore? Or how does all that work out? With my ex-wife? Uh-huh. Uh, our relationship's still rebuilding. So we haven't had, and she, she's acknowledged uh, in the, in the past that I had changed. Right. Uh, but it's interesting. I am still working through this. So I still, I still don't have like a, a, yeah. a clear, a clear view of it, but it seems like, you know, when you want somebody to change and they do change, they might, they might not change the way you want them to. Yeah. <laughs> like it, it doesn't work. And this is true for everyone. Cause I, I also tried to change her. Right. Um, and I think that's, that was, if you talk about the, there's the downfall of our relationship. We both were trying to change each other instead yeah. of just letting each other be who we are. Um, and that's, that can be really hard. Uh, so that, that control factor, right. But um, between me and her, I, she's recognized it. Um, but as you change, so, uh, I think that, that causes you to grow apart in certain ways. Yeah. Um, especially when you're both trying to make each other change. We, my wife and I were married for 40 years. She passed this past November, but we, um, I think when we got married, we weren't trying to change each other. We, we actually had very dramatic differences. I'm blind. She's in a wheelchair. Um, we came from different backgrounds, but in a sense, we had some very similar backgrounds. We both loved teaching. She was a teacher for 10 years. And um, I went in different directions and so far as teaching. But I think even over that time of 40 years of marriage, we did change. We both did change um, and grew closer together in a lot of ways. And one of the things that we really didn't want to have were walls. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that you, you've got to deal with in a marriage is not letting walls build up and not communicating. So we love to talk to each other. Um, we we did a lot of things together. I would get audio books and we would read them together. I taught her how to listen to books, which uh, which was fun. And so we a lot of times instead of watching TV while we were doing different things, we'd have a book on. Wow, I so, love that. Yeah, we we really worked at it. That's beautiful. Um, what a great relationship that sounds like. That's that's that sounds so healthy. Well, we had our challenges, of course, but by the same token, it, it did work out well. And so we we communicated and um, and had a lot of fun. And I think that's really it. It's all about also having fun. That's important to do, too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think when I was younger and my ex-wife and I were married, you, you, you meet people where you're at. And I notice this the more as life goes on. You meet people where you're at. So the kinds of people that come into your life at certain stages in your life um, reflect the things that you're trying to work on, right? So I was still trying to figure out who the heck I was and um, and had so much turmoil within me around that, uh, that uh, it brought turmoil into my relationships. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm older, I just turned 40 in June. I feel much more at peace with myself. And so I seem to have just, I'm more peaceful with people in my life. At least I'd like to think so. <laughs> you could ask other people in my life. They feel the same way, but I think I am. Um, and so I bring, it seems like I bring more peaceful people into my life and more peaceful situations. Um, but I'm so grateful for every everybody in my life and all, everything that's happened in my life. I really try to, uh, my mentor, Ray, once again, to bring him up, um, he says everything's a blessing depending on how you look at it, you know? So there's a blessing in everything if you look at it the right way. And uh, there's so much truth in that. It's so amazing. Uh, God works everything for good for you to grow, right? So there's a blessing in everything. Every curse can be a gift depending on how you look at it. And you mentioned something about walls there. My fiance said this to me uh a couple of weeks ago it was really good she said there's dream builders and there's wall builders because <laughs> i was i i was i was moaning and complaining about something i don't know what it was and she said sometimes rob you put up a wall and then you'll sit there and you'll yell at it 
<laughs> yeah. And I was like, that's so good. I, that's exactly what, and she wasn't mean about it. She was very loving about it, but she was just very factual. Like you've put this wall up and you're just yelling at the wall. Just walk around it and, and make the dream happen. I thought that was, it was profound for me. It made, it made a lot of sense to me. So. It does make a lot of sense. I think that's pretty cool. I love that expression. Um, you build dreams or you build walls. And it's it's cool to build and then work at living the dream. And, you know, the other side of it is that you can build a wall around a dream so that the dream doesn't evolve too. Um, mm. So the bottom line is that we decide, uh, well, we're living our dream. And maybe we're not really living our dream. We've locked ourselves into something. And again, it gets back to the whole idea of change. We don't allow ourselves to evolve and change like we probably should. Yeah, very true. Yeah, that's my uh, my personal uh, major purpose in life is is to know, to learn and know breakthrough strategies and then to experience breakthrough and help others experience breakthrough, right? That personal freedom that comes from breakthrough and comes from p finding more of your potential. I, there's nothing more invigorating and uh, freeing than that, right? To yeah. break down those walls, man, it feels so good, which is why my podcast, which you were on the unstuck movement, that's the point is like getting unstuck. What does it take to make, to have those breakthroughs and to get unstuck? I just love that. And what's really fun about that is as you are able to help other people do that and and succeed, it isn't ego to say uh, it helps you too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beneficial for everybody involved. That's I always think of Jim Collins, uh, good to great, right? The, in good yeah. to great, the best businesses were win-wins, right? So they created as many wins as possible. And that's how you win in life because you you benefit from it. And so does everybody else. Like that's the that's the goal. And I, I can remember being uh, when I first started getting into personal development, I was watching a lot of Tony Robbins and he was uh, just talking a lot about being of service to people. And I honest to God was like being of service to people like what the heck? Why would I need to be of service to other people if I'm trying to make money or whatever it is? And I was so uh, my my perspective was so a 180 of what it is now. And I remember thinking those thoughts of like service, like, how do I be of service? What the heck? How does that even work? Like, that's, that's where my head was at. Yeah. Um, so I, I was very stuck, to say the least. Yeah. And obviously, you, you've at least started, I won't say you figured it out, because figuring it out is a lifetime process, but you've yeah. certainly made significant progress at figuring it out. Yes, I've I, every day is another chance to do that. Every day when you wake up, it's another opportunity to get it's unstuck enough. because I don't know how you are when you wake up, Michael. But when I wake up, I'm like, oh, I don't want to get up. I'm not ready to get up. I don't want to do this <laughs> every morning. <laughs> it's like every morning starts the thing over again of like, oh, I got to get out of bed. Oh, it's so comfy in my bed. Uh, I just want to lay here and sleep. And I used to sleep a lot, man. I, I would, I used to, you know, I, I was a partier. So we'd stay up till 6 a.m. Mm. and I'd sleep till 2 p.m. and work seven to midnight and do it all over again and uh, built some bad habits into my life. And um, the morning thing for me is like a reminder every morning. That's right. It's, it's uh, maybe that's why it's difficult every morning because it needs to be because it needs, I need that reminder to like get my butt going. For me, I know that if I have, uh, if I, when I wake up in the morning, if I really just, oh, I don't want to get up, I probably didn't get enough sleep or I'm still tired. I've learned that because a lot of times when I wake up, like this morning, I usually get up about 5.30 and I get up because of a couple of things. One, it might very well be that I wake up. The other is I have a cat who likes to get petted while she eats and um, one time during the night, she'll come and walk on me until I get up and go pet her while she's eating. And she loves it. And I've always told her, you don't get to double dip. You mm -hmm. can't do that more than once. <clears throat> a couple of times she's tried, but at 530, if I start to move, she comes up and says hello again. So I usually get up and mostly don't mind a bit, but occasionally I 
just really am, am tired, which tells me probably I didn't get enough sleep, although mm-hmm. I try to go to bed early. Um, so for me, I'm used to getting up in the morning. Um, I'm used to being up and and doing things because a lot of my jobs during my sales career were selling from the West Coast to the East Coast. And the result was that I would be up early. In fact, for um, six months, when I first started one job, Karen drove me 45 miles to go to work every day. And I had to be there by six to open the office to do that. Mm. And then later on, um, we moved down to the Carlsbad Vista area in California. So she didn't have to do that. She wasn't such a morning person, but at the same time she could get up to and did. But for me, um, mostly I didn't mind getting up, but if I started to object, I went, Oh, why am I doing that? Um, so I guess that's some sort of self-analysis. It's interesting. Yeah, if, if I have to get up, man, I'll get up and I'm good, right? I, I did morning radio for over half a decade. You know, in morning radio, I had to be there at 5 a.m. to do the morning. Yeah, good show, point. And I loved it. It was awesome. Uh, so I can do it, but it's almost if I have a if I have to do something, then I'll get up. If I don't have to and I don't wake up, I get up at seven o'clock in the morning. It's not like I, I sleep in or anything like mm-hmm. that, but um. It seems to me, and this is maybe still something I need to work on for myself, is like that motivation to pop out of bed and like be excited. Like I am excited about, I love what I do, but man, the bed's so comfy in the morning. Yeah. So cozy. Yeah. Well, and I don't. <laughs> so we'll see that's as time goes on if that changes. I don't pop out of bed, but I I I get up, um, and I know what what's coming up because I've thought about it the night before, and so I'm sort of programmed to be thinking about it when I wake up. And I get up and I enjoy it, um, but I also have a routine in the morning. On the weekends, different story. I will sleep late on the weekends. That's the mm-hmm. time I get to sleep, and I will do that. And uh, even the cat mostly sleeps with me and leaves me alone. My guide dog, Alamo, is very easy. He doesn't get up at all until I get up, and then he's all excited and wants to play and wants to eat and wants to go outside and all that. So it works out pretty well. But you know, um, it is a matter of recognizing what we have to do. And most mornings I do have to get up, although not necessarily right at 530, but it's easier to do. So um, that's what I do. I, I often think of there's a there's a, a Bible verse. I'm trying to think of it right now about sleep. Uh, oh, I'm not going to be able to, to think of it anyways. Go ahead. I was going to try to recite it, but it's not coming to me. Yeah, but well, I, just, I know from I know for me, like there's uh, sleep is so is so fundamental and, and important, right? But to, it's something that along the lines about not loving sleep. I like, do not love sleep because it's a it's a thief, right? It can be yeah, uh, it steals your time, it steal it could steal your life away. So yeah, get get what you need, but don't yeah, overindulge. Don't overindulge. Yeah, um, and that can be, and I can see how that could be easy to do. That generally hasn't been the way I am. Um, like I said, weekends I'll sleep especially now since it's just me in the house. So there's nothing, unless there's a specific event, there's nothing that requires me to get up. So I'll sleep a little bit longer, but then that helps during the week when I don't sleep as much. So it's okay. Mm. Well, you know, um, where do, um, where do we get our vision for life from? How do we really form that overall? And, and how do we lean into that? Oh, big question. <laughs> I, I go back to that question of um, I go back to the question of what did you want to do when you were 10 years old? I love that question so much. It speaks to me all the time. I ask people that question. Actually, I want to ask you that question. What did you want to be when you were 10? Well, as I said, I wanted to teach. Um, I've always liked being around people. And so I figured I wanted to be a teacher. Um, That's right. But I also at the same time. I think I was pretty used to the concept of my life might change over time and we'll see how it goes. But teaching, I thought, would always be part of what I did. Hmm. And so for me, I wanted to be a radio DJ. I wanted to be a a professional wrestler, right? So (laughs) those two things. (laughs) Um, 
And I was a professional wrestler when I was 18 for six months and I was not for me. So I, I when I think about vision, I think like there's life leaves clues behind, right? So there are clues throughout your life that lead towards the vision in your life. So I spend I, I spent a lot of time before I was a Christian meditating. And I spent a lot of time praying and meditating mm-hmm. and uh, just trying to like let myself figure out like what is this vision for my life? And I think a lot of it comes from and this can be different for different people, but I love the idea of making your mess your message. And I think that's the part of the vision. We get things we 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 are dealt bad hands in our lives in certain areas of our lives. We get through those bad things in our life and we can use those things to help other people, but getting through those things propels us forward. So our vision is kind of dictated around how we get past those things and what those difficult things were in our life. Uh, In a general sense, this is how I often look at it. Like, a vision for what I want my life to be. I've made it through these difficult areas in my life. I've experienced these breakthroughs. What's the furthest I can go outside of that? So let me go one year. Let me go five years. Let me go 10 years. Let me go to my funeral. Let me see myself in the casket. And this is a difficult practice, I, it, but it's it's really helpful. If I am in my casket, you know, it's kind of like, what does your tombstone say? Who's at your funeral? And what are they saying about you when they're at your funeral? For yeah. me, that's my vision of if I'm going to form the rest of like my successes out of that or form everything, everything would come out of like, okay, I'm in my casket and people are standing over me and they're saying things about me. What are they saying about me? How have I impacted the people in that room? How many people are there? Why are they there? And then reverse engineer. I, I love the concept of, of reverse engineering, right? Mm-hmm. So reverse engineer, here I am. I passed away. I lived a full life. I did amazing things. Here's what they're saying about me. Now, how do I reverse engineer and what does that look like? And that can go in a million different directions for a million different people. But in general, that's, I think if you're going to create a real vision, not just a financial vision or not just a, you know, success climbing the success ladder vision, but a, the spiritual vision for who you want to be whenever you pass away to the rest of the world, um, then all the success and the the material things will come along with that. And you can put those pieces together once you figure out what you want people to say about you. Well, that makes sense. It does. The interesting part about that is let's say you're going through that exercise and you're going, what are people saying about me when I'm in my casket? If you, start to think, well, they're not saying very nice things about me. Um, I think introspection is a very important thing. And when you when you're doing it, if you get that kind of a message about what people are saying, that's also something to reverse engineer and say why. Mm-hmm. And now we get back to our change issue. How do we deal with that? Exactly. If you're if you're doing and you're honest with yourself, right? You're not blinding yourself to your to your flaws and, and your seeing what people were saying about you, man, that's, there you go. There's the things I need to change right there. Yeah. If they're saying like, well, maybe your kids, I didn't see him enough. Or uh, your, your friend said, well, he, you know, he was always so wrapped up in his work or, um, you know, wh- whatever it might be, I, I, whatever right. those things could be. It's like, oh, that's, if your conscience tells you that and you're listening to your conscience, um, it, it'll reveal what those things are. So yeah, it can be really powerful, but it's also really difficult. It can be super painful to do, right? Especially if you aren't doing some things the way you want to do them. Um, well, and maybe the way you want to do them isn't necessarily the best way. And that's, or it might be the best way. And that's what you have to learn. You know, for me, I, a couple of lessons that, that I've really come to embrace. Um, one deals with being in the world trade center and getting out. And as I was running literally away from tower two, I heard a voice in my head. Well, I I started by saying, God, I can't believe that you got us out of a building just to have one fall on us. And I heard a voice as clearly as you and I are talking now that said, don't worry about what you can't control. Focus on what you can and the rest will take care of itself. And it said, in my case, focus on running with Roselle and and you guys will be okay or you'll be okay. But I heard that voice and the 
part, part that I think is the most significant is don't worry about the things you can't control. Yeah. And so like with the World Trade Center, could we have as a country figured it out and predicted it and stopped it? I still haven't seen the evidence that we really could. Maybe we could have, um, which is another learning experience, but I'm not convinced of that. But even so, I didn't have control over that. Mm -hmm. And so the World Trade Center happened. And a lot of people say, well, don't you have survivor's guilt or don't you feel bad about the people who died? And yes, I feel very sad about the people who died. Do I have survivor's guilt? No, I don't. Um, because I didn't have control over surviving unless I decided I was just going to stay in the building and see what happened. But clearly that wasn't a choice that I was going to make. So the issue is I didn't have control over the World Trade Center happening. But what I have have and had absolute control over was how I chose to deal with the World Trade Center happening. And when the opportunity, for example, came along to travel somewhere because somebody said, we'd like to hire you to come and speak and tell us what we should learn and all that. It just resonated. And I went, that seems like the right thing to do. Of course, what I, what I tell people when I describe it is I, um, I was sitting in my office thinking about the fact that people want to hire me to come and speak. Selling computers can be a real challenge for a lot of reasons in terms of selling to a committee and doing all sorts of stuff. So why do I want to sell computers when people want to hire me just to come and talk to them? So, um, but it really is a whole lot more complicated than that. And the reality is that it was worth doing. Um, I felt at the time and still absolutely feel because if it helps people move on and helps people deal with their own issues, then it's worth doing. Absolutely, man. I mean, that, that there's the blessing that was, that came out of a, a bad situation, you know, what a blessing that came out of that and what a, how cool that, well, not how cool, because I'm like, people, well, lots of people passed away, but what an interesting way and cool way for your life to transform from such yeah. a tragic event. That's, I, I love hearing that kind of stuff because, man, what a terrible day, what a terrible moment in American history. But at the same time, how many people have you helped because of that event happening and you surviving it? Well, and the issue is that, of course, dealing with the World Trade Center or, or, or anything like that where an unexpected change happens. If you really stop and look at it, you can trace what you do to the choices that you made along the way. I mean, I can, I can go back and look at a lot of choices in my life that I've made that got me to exactly where I am. A couple of the choices weren't necessarily the best, but like with the World Trade Center uh, happening um, and then I had the choice. Do I continue to sell computers? It's the safe thing to do. I have a good income. It should continue. But then this incredible opportunity came along. And how could I resist? That was kind of the way I looked at it. Yeah. And and that's actually what, what Karen felt as well. We both agreed um, that if it would help other people move on from September 11th for me to speak, if I could teach um people a little bit more about blindness and guide dogs and and other things like that and have an impact it was worth doing and there's so many stories i've heard since about why it was worth doing absolutely and to, to go off of what you were saying there uh the voice <laughs> that you heard right as clearly as as we're talking now when you were in the world trade center you know um don't worry about what you can't control is that some, yeah. what, 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 what did it say? What did God Don't say worry here? about what you can't control. And in this case, it was focused on running with Roselle, but it's the same thing. Focus on what you can and the rest will take care of itself. So I, I had a dream uh, back in, I think it was December of 2020. My ex-wife and I had separated. We set, we were had a two-year separation. And that was just, it was just a real big question mark transition period in my life and for the world, right? We were still in the midst of the pandemic and stuff like that. And I had this dream. I was with my grandma. So my grandma had passed away and she, we were always close and her and I were driving in a car in this dream over this bridge in my, in my town that I live in. And she was driving, which she never drove anywhere. Uh, well, no, she did. She never drove me anywhere that I could recall. Except crazy. <laughs> you know she never drove me crazy she was okay. very sweet um but she was holding my hand but i looked down at my hand and it was a, a little kid's hand so i was like a little kid i was probably mm -hmm. like 
four or five years old. And while we're driving, going over this bridge, she leans over and gives me a big hug. And I start freaking out saying, Graham, you're going to wreck the car. You got to look at where we're going. And she said to me, don't worry about where I'm going. Just love me. And she said, don't worry about where you're going. Just love people. And obviously that was God in the dream speaking through my grandma. And uh, that message has stuck with me. It was such a real, I've never had a more real dream in my life. Like it hit me. I woke up crying and I cried for days on and off after that because I kept reliving it. And it was, it had such a visceral, like, you know, I can feel it right now when I talk about it. It's just, it was so real. Um, the truth in it. And it was so simple. So I I've spent my life worrying about where I'm going to go, trying to control things, right. And not spending as much time just loving the process and loving people. And so I think about that often. And in your, what God said to you inside of the world trade centers made me think of that, which is kind of the same message, right? Stop worrying about how it's going to turn out, how you're going to get there, where it's going to go. Just love people while you're going through it. And that's the best that you could do. And be open to getting messages, be open to change, and be open to yeah. moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Which which brings up something, and I think I know the answer to this, but tell me about the significance of the acorn and the oak tree. Oh, man, that's going back to Ray, uh, my mentor. That's one of his favorite stories, right? Yeah. So the entire potential of the oak tree is inside of the acorn, Correct. right? So that that giant hundreds of foot feet tall oak tree is inside of every acorn but if that acorn's thrown in the shale it's not going to do anything if it's sitting in on your porch it's not going to do anything uh you know it, th- that that acorn has to be planted in the nutrients that it needs in the ground right so it there's the potential in everybody to become a massive oak tree which is uh, you know just everything you'd ever want all of the potential you could ever have is there but if you're not planted in fertile soil which for us would be rooted in truth right truth rooted and love having, having the right people in your life um having paying attention listening uh thinking the right things uh putting yourselves in the right in the right situations following following truth um I, I i love it so much because the it's crazy to think like you see that acorn and inside of that if you plant it in the soil with all the nutrients that it needs it is going to grow into a massive oak tree and it's not going to happen overnight it's going to take a long time for it to get there but all of that potential is inside of there it's really really what i think about that is it's a fascinating concept because it shows right. like we all have that potential we all have that god-given potential it might it's not might it will look different for everyone as we grow that's okay we keep feeding ourselves those correct nutrients we it will we will prosper into that potential yeah exactly and that potential is available for every single one of us Mm -hmm. it's really a matter of dealing with getting the right nutrients and getting into the right soil um, and I think instinctively, most of us know how to do that, um, or we allow ourselves to be guided to it. And again, all too often, we let the walls get in the way and we don't get there, which is a problem. Yeah. And for, for, I think for most people, too, one of the things we're really struggling with right now in society, we need more nature in our life. You need more peace in nature. The more I get out away from the computer, right? Uh, Which, of course, we're on right now. Um, But I've been spending so much more time not on my computer, not on my phone. Funny thing, I I, I live in a rural area. Well, it's it's a smaller town, but there's a lot of rural around me. And I have some ex Mennonite friends Mm. who and Mennonites are like close to the Amish. They're like they're like immediate they're like the in between. They can't right. decide if they're they can't decide if they're Amish. They can't decide if they're civilians, right? Regular civilians. So it's like this middle ground. But they're ex Mennonites, and uh, they have a landscaping and hardscaping company. And this summer, I felt so 
compelled to just be outside my office that I'm in right now. I have two big windows in front of me, so I'm getting good. I get good sunlight, but it's like I can see how beautiful it is outside and I'm in here on this computer all day long. Yeah. So I actually went to him and said, hey, can I do I just want to do like, you know, 10 hours, maybe 15 hours a week part time, just digging in the dirt, building stuff and being outside. And it has been so helpful. And so I've I've, I've had so many breakthroughs and my Coaching business has grown more in the past two and a half months than it did in the past uh, eight months or nine months from, and I personally believe this, from me getting away from technology, not thinking about it, not obsessing over it, and doing things that are totally, honestly, these things are foreign to me. Like, I don't Mm -hmm. know how to build patios, but we're building patios. And I'm out there sweating and I'm focusing on pounding a nail in or focusing on power washing something off or whatever it might be. And I noticed that my life is getting better and more peaceful. A lot of my aches and pains are going away. The shoulder pain that I often have, the hip pain that I often have, these pains are not as prevalent. It's been like really uh, eye opening for me. It's been very, very helpful. And I, and I feel like for a lot of people, the, the thing we're stressing and struggling with the most is we're constantly going, 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 and we're not out in nature, just just being and just doing. For me, um, one of the things that I don't like to do when I fly to travel somewhere to speak, I don't like to work on airplanes. Um, mm-hmm. And I know there are a lot of people who are doing it. I like to sit and read. It's one of the times, not the only time by any standard, but it's the time I prepare before going somewhere and unwind after being somewhere. I sit and I read and I enjoy it. I just plain relax. And I find that I do much better as a speaker when I take those hours of time to relax because I know that when I land somewhere to speak, I need to be on from the time I land until I leave. And mm. that's draining um, in a lot of ways. And so, Taking that time is important. And, you know, I know what you're saying about being on the computer all the time. And yeah, that's something that that we we don't need to do. I use my computer as a communications device and a lot of other things that that require me to use it, but I recognize that it's a tool. And I also know that if need be, I can move away from it and not have a problem doing that. I'm not locked into having to be on the computer or running the computer all day, every day. Michael, that thing about the airplanes is so good. I I love airplanes and road trips because it's like it's it's total freedom. Like an airplane, you're not responsible for anything. On a road right. trip, unless you're driving, then you're responsible. But even yeah, on a road trip, yeah. when you are driving, it's like I don't have to worry about anything else right now. All I have to do is just drive this car. On right. the airplane, it's it's a total it's a it's an opportunity just to fully disconnect. You have no responsibilities, and you're kind of this for me goes back to this whole kid concept. You're kind of like a kid again. Yeah. Just just do whatever the heck you want to do and enjoy it. Absolutely. Love- so what's the secret for people to get unstuck? Well, the secret to get unstuck is to get some butter. You got to lather yourself up really well. There you go. Wiggle yourself out of maybe get some uh, cooking oil or something. Get yourself out of that spot you're trapped in. <laughs> I Are just had the vision cute? in my head of, of, I know. of every every sitcom where a kid got his head stuck between the railings of the stairs going upstairs and they butter his head up to pull his head out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the I think the trick to getting unstuck is all the things we've been talking about. One of the biggest things that's been working for me I'm going I'm to try to say a couple of things here and not mix them all up together. I think getting unstuck is you need the vision, right? So uh, in the in that book I was talking about, I, it's called the Vitals System that I I created. That when I'm coaching people, I, I take them through the Vitals. The V is for vision, the I is for impact, the T is for transformation or technology, depending on the conversation we're having. Uh, the A is for action, the L is for leadership. And the S is for service. So if we're going to get unstuck, we need to have a vision for our life. So you need a vision of where you're going and what does that look like? And like we talked about the the funeral test, reverse engineer it. 
the I is for impact. Like we should, if you think of anybody, if you can, if you can think of someone. So Michael, think of somebody right now, just name somebody. Um, my favorite teacher, Dick Herbelsheimer. Okay. Dick Herbelsheimer had an impact on your life. Oh yeah. Like you wouldn't say his name unless he made an impact on your life. And still does. And still, right. Still does. So you, you need to make an impact. If you want to get unstuck, you have to gravitate towards impact and gravitate towards people who have made a positive impact in your life. Uh, The T one is uh, transformation, right? Because I, I think breakthrough transformation those are things we need to experience that's what uh, if we want to be if we want to get unstuck we need to transform into something new we need to transform into a, a new version of ourselves or find a higher potential but that t is also for technology when i'm working with businesses and things like that uh, oftentimes it is using new technology not letting technology use you so right now we're in this whole ai space and uh, it, it seems scary and I don't even know. None of us really know where this is going, but I'm going to use it to my advantage to help me move forward. So I think for a lot of businesses, using the right technology to get unstuck is very important. Not sticking your head in, head in the stand, being open to change. Uh, the A for action. So you have to take action. I have a, an acronym that I always use, which is WMNNMW. We move now no matter what. So no matter what is going on, keep moving forward. It might not be the perfect decision, but make a decision and move. Uh, the L is for leadership. We, you have to, we have to be personal leaders. Whether you desire to be a leader or not, too bad. Like you're, you're some form of leader somewhere in your life. And if you're not leading your own life, somebody else is. And then the S is for service. How can you be of service to others? How can you show up for other people? What what are you doing that is of service that gets you outside of yourself so you're not thinking about you and your problems so much? If you focus your, and it's so true. And this is, when I heard Tony Robbins talk about service years ago, I didn't get it. And I was so wrapped up in my own crap that I, I, I couldn't be of service to anybody because I couldn't get past me and my own problems. But the more I spend time helping others and being of service to others, the less I think about me and the better I get. It's really an interesting, it's it's so counterintuitive, but I, I in a simple form, that's what I would say to get unstuck are those acronym, that, that acronym of, of the vital system. And the reason I do my podcast, The Unstuck Movement, is because we need stories of perseverance. So we need examples. So I think it's, you know, in the beginning, you need the examples. Oh, Somebody else got unstuck from a situation similar to mine. So I know that I can do it too. So it's good to know, but then the vital system is like the propulsion to like get you through that stuck period. And and we're going to keep getting stuck. I feel like I, uh, you plateau, you can call it getting stuck or you can call it plateauing, but like we, we all plateau at certain places in our lives and you need to have a breakthrough to get through that next plateau. And then another one will come. And it's good to know that in life. It's really good to to know and acknowledge I'm going to plateau. I'm going to get stuck somewhere down the road here. And as long as I know that's going to happen, now it's not going to be this catastrophic thing when it happens. I, I remember thinking like when I was younger, oh, if I just get this benchmark done for school, then I don't have to worry about anything. So I get the project done. And I'm like, ah, I can just screw off now. But then there's always something right around the corner that's coming again. There's always something new coming right around the corner. Uh, So acknowledging life is about progress. Life is about breakthrough. and, And you're supposed to get stuck so you can get the breakthrough to reach more of your potential. And it all starts with making the choice to do it. Sometimes we... We think we're not making the choice and we're just led to it or we're pushed into it, but ultimately it's our choice. Yeah. Which is so important. Look at it like, well, what's, there's an opportunity here. Yeah, There's an opportunity to grow (laughs) in everything that is bad in your life. And I know that's easy to say because I haven't gone through some of the really difficult things other people have gone through. Um, But I just know for myself personally and hearing it from other people uh, that those things Every difficult thing is an opportunity for you to have that breakthrough. And we need to really make that our mindset, that it is an opportunity. Life's an adventure. 
full of opportunity and we just need to learn to take it when the opportunities come along. Yes, absolutely. Well, if people yeah, the, want, because, oh, go ahead. because, uh, and I just want to say, um, you know, things can happen to you in life, but if you're not in the, like people say like luck, there's no such thing as luck. It's whenever uh, mm -hmm. opportunity meets experience. Right. So if you're, if you, an opportunity could arise, that's an amazing opportunity, but you're not prepared. Like you have, you've not prepared to be ready for that opportunity. So if it comes to you at the wrong time, when you're not prepared, that's not luck. Right. But when you're prepared and you've, you're experienced and you're ready for it, that opportunity arises. Now all of a sudden you're lucky. Right. So I look at, to to be more prepared is like to constantly be working on yourself to be growing to become a better version of yourself because every day all day long there's opportunities all over the place for you in your life opportunities to help other people uh, opportunities for you to grow for you to serve uh, if you look at life from that perspective you will see opportunities all day long and the reality is that when you prepare the opportunities come. And when you don't prepare, the opportunities may very well have been there, but you weren't prepared enough to recognize them. And so you let them pass you by. Yeah. You got your blinders on. So you'd never yeah. even see them. It's really interesting. <clears throat> well, if people want to reach out to you, maybe um, talk to you about being their coach or learn more about the unstuck movement and so on, how do they do that? The best ways to get a hold of me, uh, my website is leadimpacttransform.com, lit coaching. The lit stands for lead impact transform. So leadimpacttransform.com. Uh, Facebook, if you want to reach out, probably the, the easiest way to get a hold of me, Rob Z Wentz on Facebook. Just send me a friend request. I'll accept the friend request and we can chat from there. Uh, those are the, the two easiest ways to get a hold and, of me. And Wentz is spelled? W-E-N-T-Z. There you go. So Rob C. Wentz. Well, I want to thank you for being here. And this has been an absolutely insightful and fun conversation. I've had fun. I hope you have. Yeah, yeah I certainly <laughs> have, Michael. <laughs> say it's the been least. great getting to know you too, man. I, I just want to say uh, and, 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 and honor you. I love what you do. I love your enthusiasm and your passion. The fact that you've helped so many people going back uh, to 9-11 and even before that. What an incredible story you have. I'm just honored to 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 know you and get a chance to like share with you and have you share with me. It, it means a lot to me. So thank you. Well, the honor is mine. And I really appreciate all the time that you've taken with us today and the fact that we got to be on your podcast as well. So people, if they want to listen to your podcast, how do they do that? What's it called again? It's called the Unstuck Movement. And right now, the best ways to find it, any podcast app, right? So podcast, Apple, uh, Spotify. You know, every podcast app you can think of, it's on there. And then I put the videos right now. You can see all of the videos on Facebook on my Rob Z Wentz Facebook page. Eventually, they'll be up on YouTube and, and going a bunch of different places. But right now, they're all on Facebook. Cool. Well, thanks again for doing this and being here. And I want to thank you for listening to us today. Reach out to Rob. I know he'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you. And I'm easy to reach. You can get me by email. Michael H I M I C H A E L H I at accessibe, A C C E S S I B E dot com, or go to our podcast page. Got to have those www.michaelhinkson, H I N G S O N dot com slash podcast. But wherever you're listening, and as Rob said, and is true for us as well, you can hear us and probably are on all sorts of different platforms and so on. Please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate it. We love it. Love to hear your thoughts. Love to hear your feedback and anything that you want to say to us. And for you, Rob, and you listening, if you know of anyone else who we ought to have as a guest on Unstoppable Mindset, please let us know. Introduce us. We are always looking for more people to come on and chat with about whatever they want to chat about. Because as Rob will tell you, this is really talking about what you want to talk about, not what I want to talk about. And that's one of the things that we really love. So, Rob, once more, I want to thank you for being here and taking the time with us today. Thank you so much. It was an honor.